Oversight Board meeting off with a reading of the appeal statement. Pursuant to the provisions of section 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, please take notice that decisions of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County Community Oversight Board may be appealed to the Chancery Court of Davidson County for review under a common law writ of cert. Any appeal must be filed within 60 days after entry of a final decision by the board. Any person or other entity considering an appeal should consult with an attorney to ensure that time and procedural requirements are met. I'll um, do a roll call vote, uh, uh, take roll by calling everyone's name. Mr. Brown, I don't think he was going to join us today. Um, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Mr. Goddard. Here. Mr. Hayes. Present. Dr. Hildreth. Present. Mr. Holloway. Here. Dr. Kong. Present. Ms. McCree. Present. Mr. Witzel. Here. And Mr. Wynn. Present. Thank you, everyone. I will hand it over to uh, Mr. Dickerson for the electronic meeting statement. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, can you hear me? We can. Okay, um, just wanted to uh, remind everyone that if you do not have your camera on when you speak um, to identify yourself, uh, that's one of the requirements of the executive order. Um, I will also note for the, for the board that the executive order does not look like it's going to be extended so we're working with all the boards and commissions um, to on uh, how to safely conduct in-person hearings going forward and working with the health department. We have some good guidelines on that. So um, I'll be working with your staff to, to make sure that next month's meeting is, is comfortable on that. Uh, but for the last time, probably, uh, the motion you're looking for is that the proposed agenda constitutes essential business of this body and that meeting electronically is necessary for the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. Thank you, Mr. Dickerson. Is there a motion? So move. Thank you, Mr. Goddard. A second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. And we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Brown is not with us. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Aye. Mr. Goddard. Aye. Mr. Hayes. Aye. Dr. Hildreth. Aye. Mr. Holloway. Aye. Dr. Kong? Aye. Ms. McCree? Aye. Mr. Witzel? Aye. And Mr. Wynn? Aye. And speaking of Mr. Wynn, um, I wanted to welcome you for your first meeting here um, as a new board member. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, uh, welcome and thank you all. I'm excited to be here uh, on this board. I hope I can, uh, you know, be of uh, aid uh, with my experience. So let me give you just a, a minute of who I am. I am retired from the Metro Police Department. I retired as a lieutenant detective in 2000. And after uh, leaving the department, I started working as a consultant to the Justice Department. And I, most of my work today is with uh, the uh, Office of Violence Against Women, the Office of Victims of Crime, and the Civil Rights Division, the Justice. Uh, but while I was on the police department, uh, I helped build our Domestic Violence Division in 95, and I <laughs> supervised there for six years. I was on the SWAT team for 15 years. I worked in homicide patrol. I taught at our academy. I uh, worked in intelligence for, for a while. Um, so I worked a wide range of jobs uh with with metro before uh, before i retired and um all the work i did with nashville um sort of helped me and the work that i'm doing today as a consultant uh for the doj and also work for the state department i'm a fulbright specialist for the department of state and they sent me to about 16 other countries working in gender-based violence and um anti-bias policing uh techniques so um all of that and a lot more I hope to bring to help with the work that you all are doing here on the uh, Community Oversight Board. So thank you all for, for, for having me. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Wynn, and welcome again. And I'm sure we're looking forward to working with you as well. Um, I'll get into my chair remarks here. Um, I think I'd be remiss not to hold space for the violence that our country and community has seen over this year, just this year, and since we last met. Um, I know I'm grateful for organizations and um, community members who on Saturday called for 24 hours of peace, but also um, that end that that evening, Nashville had its second fatal police shooting. Um, Director Fitchard can give us more details about MNCO's response to the scene there um, in a little bit. And I wanted to speak about my letter and how a letter to council regarding license plate readers and how it came to its final result at our April executive committee meeting. The executive committee uh, charged me with writing a letter to council expressing uh, our concerns, our reservations with the legislation. Uh, Dr. Valier on the MNCO's staff uh, was nice enough to provide me with a draft letter that included a lot of very important research. Um, and realizing that council members may not have the time to read through a longer, well-researched letter, I decided to focus on two main points, which we had discussed in our previous meetings. Um, first, it was the lack of community engagement to inform to inform the community about the legislation and the inability to conduct meaningful community, community engagement during the pandemic. Um, as the COB, I, I think this is the most important point we could make. LPRs are a serious uh, police tool, surveillance tool, and we should not come to the decision to use them lightly. In my letter, I stated LPRs treat everyone as a prospective criminal. Um, so I'll tell you what I mean by that. LPRs indiscriminately photograph the license plates of every community member uh, who happens to pass by it, whether they've committed a crime or not, whether their license plate is on a hot list or not. I heard some council members use, use this as a plus, as a selling point, basically saying that LPRs could not see our skin color and therefore making them a perfect non-racist law enforcement tool. Uh, when I heard that, I just immediately thought of the many times we're told that if we're not guilty of anything, we shouldn't worry about it when it comes to law enforcement practices. And just didn't think that was a good argument, especially for minority community members who historically have you know, been victims of over-policing um, over the years. Second, I wanted to raise awareness about the nonprofit organization Safer Nashville, which council members had told us during our meetings here was willing to donate LPR equipment to the city. When we first heard about this uh, at our meeting in December with council member Stiles, it raised a red flag for me and some of you as well, maybe all of you. Uh, I made a note to myself to do some more research on the organization because we had never heard about it but I couldn't find anything at the time. Um, in our executive committee meeting this month, it came up again with council member Rosenberg uh, who came to talk about his um, alternate legislation that he was proposing. Uh, and he informed us that council member Johnston was on the board of this organization, Safe for Nashville. Uh, that of course raised an even bigger red flag for me um, through reporting in the Tennessee Lookout. I was able to confirm that also Council Member Bob Nash and District Attorney General Gwen Funk and Assistant District Attorney Jenny Charles are also on the board of this nonprofit organization. That was extremely concerning to me. Um, the fact that two sponsors of this LPR, LPR bill sit on the board of an organization that was offering to pay for it. We still don't know much about the organization. It was registered as a nonprofit in October, which is right around the time the first LPR bill surfaced in council. Its website states it's concerned with the lack of financial support to police. Uh, it says they, along with other businesses, neighbors, political leaders, and police officers have formed the nonprofit to supply our police with the necessary tools and technology not funded by Metro Council, but needed to make a safer city for businesses and neighborhoods. Um, 
as the country, our country reimagines policing and law enforcement, I think this objective sounds like a step backward. The COB exists to review and re recommend law enforcement policy changes. But what's the point of that if, if coming together as a community to discuss what is working and what isn't working in terms of policing. And then when we, from those conversations, uh, determine where to put our tax dollars and where not to, uh, what's the point of doing that if this organization, this dark money organization can come in with an unregulated slush fund to expense what we as a community haven't decided isn't, have decided isn't working or isn't working for our community. I think we definitely need more transparency here um, going forward, especially if um, this organization is going to continue attempting to privately fund um, aspects of law enforcement that our community may not necessarily um, be supportive of, and our council may not allow a lot funding to for good reason. Um, I'm hoping my letter to council and my speaking out about it here will facilitate that. Um, I don't mean to downplay community concerns with public safety. Those are very real. It's unfortunate that our city has focused so much on LPRs over the past couple of months at the expense of working intently with our communities to implement community-based initiatives. Um, as we saw the mayor's office, you know, proposing um, in the budget to a lot money to community organizations who are on the ground um, actively working uh, on community-based safety initiatives that could possibly be an effective tool um, for to increase public safety in our communities. Um, and lastly, I want to speak out in support of our transgender community members here in Tennessee who have been attacked by hateful legislation in our legislature. Um, the U.S. has had a significant history of LGBT people uh, being mistreated by law enforcement. So I think this is an issue that we should all be concerned with. Um, we should be focusing, uh, we should be finding ways to support and include our trans community and, and not uh, ways to exclude them. And I am glad you know, the school board was able to pass a resolution um, and supported that as well. Um, and I just wanted to say to say my support here as well. Um, with that, I'll open it up for discussion or comments or questions if you have any before we go on to uh, Director Fitchard. There is nothing. Um, uh, Mr. Hayes. I just wanted to say I appreciate the detail that you went through in the letter. It was a well-written letter and that had information that I wasn't aware of, especially about the board members. Uh, that was that was concerning to me also when I saw that. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Yes, uh, it took me a lot to find that information, but I was I'm glad I was able to find it and um, bring it to light here. Thank Mr. you, Campbell Gooch. Yeah, I wanted to also like echo that, um, especially about like city council members. Um, I know they also give campaign contributions to city council members as well. Um, not, and I'm also like, this must be a trend because last year during the summer, we, we kind of found out that um, council members were also on the on boards of like core civic, but at the same time making legislative decisions around core civic as well. So like, you know, as a community member, I really appreciate um, that type of information being told to the people. So I just wanted to voice and say thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Kamaguch. Any other questions or comments? Not, I can uh, hand it off to Director Fitchard. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be back. Um, and I am going to cover 
uh, we've had a lot happen and a lot going on in this month. And so I'm going to start with our basics on our ED report. So um, as Alex, um, as Attorney Dickerson just stated, we will continue on um, with in-person meetings um, starting next month. And um, I'm very glad that Paula Person, who is our executive assistant, had already had dates booked up. Um, so we will, we're already scheduled for an in-person um, meeting for the month of May, and that was already taken care of. So that part we don't have to worry about. I think that the more concern is our small committee meetings and trying to figure out where we will have those meetings. And I will keep you guys posted on that as we go forward. Our office has remained closed, but there has been multiple, um, uh, excuse me, multiple staff members in and out, um, myself included. And we're just trying to figure out um, a best way um, for us to get back into working at the office full time. And then also following the protocols um, of Metro government. And so they have continued to keep us abreast of how that trans trans transition will um, happen. Um, as for a personnel update, um, I have um, some new knowledge to share with you, and that is we will be losing our research analyst, Liz Orozco. Um, she will be going to work for the Metro Human Rights Commission, and her last day with the agency will be on May the 14th. Um, so we will be uh, advertising her position at some point. Um, for the vacancies that we have open currently, that is the legal advisor position, as well as the investigator position. We have had uh, 57 people apply for the investigator position and 14 for the legal advisor. That um, process closes tonight um, at 11.59 p.m. And we will start the process, um, the, the interviewing process. HR will have to vet the candidates to see if they qualify, and then we will get that information and we will start the interview process. We continue to have multiple trainings through NACO and other entities. Um, the staff is really good at finding webinars and trainings for us, and so we continue to take a part of that. Community outreach, it's, it's going. We um, have really started working towards our messaging and our brochures and our information so that we can get that information out to the public. Um, I think that the, our social media platforms have been in really good at people connecting with us, but we wanna make certain that those people who don't have access to the web will have access to us. So we're working on that in events. We've been really busy with trying to plan um, the, some events for the summer as it approaches, um, because we know that once um, some of the regulations um, are lifted, um, we'll be able to connect with other agencies, community advocates and agencies and um, have, you know, outreach in a, in a more um, personal way. So. Um, I'm scheduled to be a guest panelist for Neighbor to, Ma Neighbor to Neighbors C4N Nashville 2021 Ignite Your Passion virtual gathering that is hosted by Google. It is on Saturday, May 15th, 2021. I think that there is a fee for registration. Um, and if you need more information on that, you can just let me know. But it's also on our social media platforms. Um, our research team continued to work on the advisory report initiated by the NAACP. Um, the report, it focuses on the hiring and recruitment procedures of MMPD. Um, Ms. Orozco is gonna come right behind me and talk a little bit more about that. Um, and I think she spoke, had, had conversations with you all and that information was sent to you um, with, the, in, with the information that you shared. And we're really thankful that you shared as much as you did so that they could um, make changes to the report as needed. Um, the complaint process is going really well. Um, people know where we are and they have sent in complaints. Um, we, this month alone, we have received nine investigative complaints since the last board meeting. Um, some of those have been initiated by me as well as citizens calling in and making complaints. Um, we've completed, the investigative team completed 11 records requests and assisted with 10 non-complaint calls for service 
um, as of that was as of April 23rd, last Friday. And then I also want to say that we've I think there has been over 200 hours worth of investigations done um, for since our last board meeting. And so the investigators are really, really busy and it will be really helpful to have that third investigator position filled. Um, now on to the the police officer involved shooting that happened on Saturday, April the 24th, a little after midnight, um, myself and the investigative team received a call that there was a, in a, a shooting that happened in North Nashville in the Bordeaux area. Um, assistant Clausey and um, Vernon Johnson, they responded to the scene really quickly. Um, I, I got a few calls and once I got those calls, Sorry, once I got those calls, um, I also responded to the scene and sorry. And when and then when when I got to the scene, um, we were sit, taken to the inner perimeter to view the, where the shooting took place. Um, we were updated multiple times by MMPD. Um, the chief personally updated us, Captain Lara. Um, and multiple officials of the police department. Um, at some point, um, we were asked to, did we want to watch the, the body cam, which of course we agreed to that. And we met over at headquarters and we were able to view the body cam footage of the incident. TBI was on the scene, they took over the scene and they um, sent out their um, CSI truck or whatever you want to call it. I think it's called that. And um, they continue to um, rope off the scene. And uh, I released a statement the next morning. Um, and so, of course, the scene um, was protected and the case is confidential. And we have opened up a director initiated, um, a director initiated investigation into that. Uh, the body worn camera update, it looks like the body worn cameras are moving forward. It looks like deployments have been completed for the West Precinct, the East Precinct, North, Madison, uh, the field training officers, the Titans, four of the six teams, um, countywide traffic, the training division, the special response teams, MDHA task force, and the Office of Community Engagement and Partnerships. Um, to date, there are 702 active employees equipped with body cameras, 367 vehicles are equipped with cameras. Um, it looks like they're still deploying cameras to Midtown Hills, um, Central, and the K-9 unit. The after action review board meeting that uh, we, we've been really doing really well with that. I think that we're going to be wrapping up soon with our report. We have a meeting scheduled for Friday and to, to really to discuss um, how we're going to complete our report. And I think that that will be uh, completed within the next week or two. I'm scheduled to have a force review board meeting um, on Tuesday, May the 4th. I'm going to hear I think it's for two hearings that day. Um, and that is on Tuesday, May the 4th in the afternoon. I know that there are five board members who are currently enrolled and attending the spring session of MPD's Citizens Police Academy. I was told by the liaison that they there would be at least one class in the fall session. They are trying to get two classes going, um, maybe midsummer and then in the fall. But for, for certain, they're going to have one in the fall. And so for all of our board members who have not taken the class, there you have that opportunity to take it in the fall. Um, board member training, there was some mandatory training for our board members um, through Metro Human Resources, and it was for sexual harassment prevention and diversity and inclusion that started today, April the 28th. There are still two sessions left um, before the, the fiscal year ends. Um, the next one is on May the 26th, and then after that it's June the 30th. So if you haven't registered for those classes, um, you can either reach out to me or you can reach out to Mr. Dirk Essery yourself. I sent that information to you, but if you need help with registration, just let me know. Um, we welcome Mr. Mark Wynn, 
Um, and then I also um, want to talk a little bit about the budget. And so initially we got with finance and finance asked us to find some savings in our budget. Um, we were able to come up with $29,000. And at some point they contacted us and said that um, they didn't need us to submit that amount any longer. So we were able to um, not have to submit any savings in this particular fiscal year budget. Um, I also attended three community recruitment panel meetings um, that was hosted by Deputy Chief Loki regarding MMPD's recruitment and hiring practices. We have one more meeting left. It's um, a, a group and panel of maybe seven or eight people from the community. Uh, it's really diverse. Um, talking about the recruiting process, the hiring procedures, um, we have touched on a host of things um, regarding um, how the process works. Is it accessible to everyone? Um, we talked about discrimination. We talked about bias. Um, we also were able to have the psychological examiners, the psychiatrists, um, come and speak to us on how they um, facilitate um, their psychological testing. And so that was really interesting um, and helpful to know. Um, um, lastly, I want to talk about committee meetings. We haven't had a rules and bylaws meeting since I want to say either January or early February. Um, there was some outstanding votes that were left um, at our last meeting, and that was changes that were to be made to our rules. Um, and so we will need to schedule that. Hopefully we can do that in the month of May so that we can, we have the, the rules and the changes that were voted on, um, or I'm, I'm sorry, that was suggested, but we just need to vote on those. Um, and so I will be reaching out to that committee to schedule a time next month that we can complete that so that our rules line up to where we are today. And then lastly, I want to talk about the education committee. Um, I think the education committee had one meeting. That first meeting was just kind of like to, to touch bases with everyone. And we still will need to meet again to pick a chair for that committee, as well as discuss how we can continue our training. Um, but I think it's important to include um, ways that we can collaborate with MNPD regarding their training as well. Um, and I think that we as a COB can be a help um, in, in a real way with knowing what, so that they know exactly what um, complainants and citizens and community members really are wanting um, from MMPD. Um, and so um, that wraps up my executive director's report. Are there any questions? Thank you, Director Pritchard. I will ask, we lost our chair to the Rules and Bylaws Committee, correct? That is correct. So I think we, the problem has been we don't have anyone leading the charge here. Is there anyone who would like to volunteer to be, to chair this committee? Um, it's one of the most important and uh, we, we should really focus on getting these rule changes done so it can come to the full board. If you'd like to replace a lawyer with a lawyer, I'd be happy to do that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Goddard. So uh, I guess um, we'll have someone, Julie will reach out to uh, everyone on the committee to schedule it for this month, for this coming month. Yes, um, and I did want to say um, that after we finish with the executive director's report, um, Chair Martinez will have to go back for the approval of the minutes. Oh. We will. Thank you. Any other questions for Director Fitchard? Mr. Hayes. Mr. Hayes, you're muted. All right, sorry about that. Uh, not a question, but uh, just concerning the, the section in the report about the body cameras. Uh, it would be very helpful to me if, if they would put percentages complete rather than just the numbers, uh, because I think 
you know, it, it would get it would paint a better picture on where we're at, what the status is. So I, I, I assume you got this directly from MMPD, that particular section. But if if that could even be an ask, if they would put percentages. Absolutely. Um, I will. Captain Laura is on the call. And if he could take note of that, that would be helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. I'll take care of that. Thank you, Captain Lara. Well, I'm Mr. sorry. I did... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Gooch. I have a... Uh, so I have a question uh, for uh, Director Fitcher. Go ahead, Mr. Wynn. Thank you. I, I, you know, I, this is my first meeting. I don't, I don't know the the mission for each one of these committees, but uh, as soon as I understand the the mission for the, these committees, I'm more than happy to to volunteer. Could, could you give me a quick uh, understanding of the education committee? Is that what you is that what you call it? Yes, sure. Our education committee is something new. In our MOU, um, myself and Dr. Hildreth, Dr. Hildreth was his chair of the MOU task force. Um, since we started the board, we have been talking about education. Um, not only, most of it was for us, the COB, to be educated on the practices and procedures of MMPD and then to have continuing education on policing matters. Um, but also other issues as well. I think the mandate that we have is to is mostly policing, but there's also some civil rights things that um, we may cover as well. Um, I think when we first started, the, we didn't have an education committee, but we included that language in the MOU. It's in our current MOU, and in our current MOU, um, it discusses um, you know having classes, also training with um, recruit training, um, law block, just having a better understanding of the kind of training um, that um, the police, you know, the uh, trainees, as well as the police officers have. And so what we wanted to do was create our own trainings um, and kind of incorporate MNPD in that as well. Um, I think it's helpful, though, that they understand exactly some of how our community members um, either view them or how we build legitimacy um, with the two agencies. So, you know, um, so that's it. Um, and if you want to join on, we need more help on that on that committee. So you are welcome to be a part of it for certain. Uh, yeah, yes, ma'am. I think uh, it, that's that's sort of right down my alley. I mean, I, because I'm an instructor, I'm a subject matter expert. For IACP and, and the Justice Department, I've got a, an entire menu of, of courses that I teach that might be relevant to what what the board's looking at as far as communications, standards, accountability, uh, procedural justice. Um, so I'm more than happy to, to to volunteer to be an instructor for the board or, or to, to to find national subject matter experts to come in and talk to the board on a lot of these issues. That would be terrific. Thank you so much. I'll keep you posted and I'll be contacting you directly. Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, one of the things that I left um, that just came about, and I forgot to mention this before I concluded my um, executive director's report, is today I received a MOU agreement from the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation from their attorney. Um, the, if the, some of you may recall that when we initially started doing um, negotiations for MOUs, we decided, um, the board decided to do one with a TBI. Um, it was sometime last, late last summer or early fall that myself and, and um, Assistant Director Clausey had a meeting with TBI and we discussed the MOU that we had proposed and you know sent to them. Um, so we, they, D Director Rausch and his team um, invited us over with Glenn Funk, um, the district attorney, to discuss the MOU and the content of what we um, had presented. 
And so there was some discussion about maybe holding off on that because TBI said, well, instead of us having the single document with the COB, um, let's be more inclusive and include OPA in that or MMPD, as well as the district attorney. Um, and so that what happened was they created a document that includes all four agencies. So that would be MMPD, the TBI, the district attorney, and the COB. And so they finally got that, I guess, the language together, um, the agreement from all, you know, from, from the, the chief, uh, chief Drake, as well as Director Roush, and they presented that copy to me today. And so there, I haven't had an opportunity, it's eight pages long, I haven't had an opportunity to go through it, to look at it and see if it's comparable to what we presented initially. Um, but just as I glossed over it, it looked really, um, it looked like the same language was incorporated, of course, because it includes all four agencies, it's going to have more information regarding the, the relationship relationship between TBI and MMPD. Um, but what I saw, just like I said, looking over it really quickly, it looked like the information um, that we presented was incorporated in there. There's a couple things that I will probably need to have more information on um, and we'll follow up with them. But overall, I think that it, it, it meets the, our mission and the need that we had when we presented it to them. So thank you. Thank you, Director Fitcher. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Yes, thank you for that. Thank you for that, Director Fitcher. Uh, one question. I mean, I have a couple questions, but I just want to make sure I heard you right. We we've had nine com nine complaints this month. Yes. Okay. So, um, first, let me say the the heat map that is in the um in the in the report that we saw that we that we were sent was amazing. Also, the data points where we can compare what zip codes had how many complaints compared to the zip codes now. Mm -hmm. um, th those two things were great. I would also um, be curious about how the complaints move like how the number of complaints go up and down. And the reason why I say that is because with gun violence, and, I, and I'm talking about uh, police violence as well, we know that they usually take off between um, April and August um, and then several different reasons. But what I, was, what I was going to ask is, is there anything that you think you can point to when you, when you talk about um, the nine complaints? Or is there any like pattern that you're seeing as far as like where we are this year compared to where we were last year. I just wanted you to speak on that a little bit more. Okay, I'm going to pass that over to Mr. Clausey because I don't have the complaints. Um, the complaints come to me when they're after they have been prepared. Um, and so, you know, I haven't looked at the types. So if, are you available, um, Mr. Clausey, to talk a little bit about that? Sure, sure. So the director initiated complaints that we've that we've taken on that obviously Director Fitcher has has initiated are all similar. They're all involving uh, officer and involved shootings. Uh, so those those really haven't changed. And then and then what we're seeing primarily from complaints that we're getting have to do with um, uh, officer the interactions with the officers, the way they're the way people are talked to, the way they are treated, the way they feel. Um, less than maybe we would see uh, with maybe excessive uses of force or things like that. Most of it has to do with with that type of, of like a behavior issue. So that's primarily what we're seeing. But um, to have, I think it's four or five that we have now, director initiated complaints this early is, you know, that that I, I, we didn't have that big of a spike last year. So that's that's concerning. Okay, thank thank you for that. Um, thank you for that. Thank you for the answer. They gave me a lot. And then my next question, and, and and I think this is a question of nuance. So we might not be able to answer this as a board, but I think this is what we're going to have to consider as the city moves to a more surveillance type of policing. I mean, that's that seems to be a humongous appetite among city council members to get these type of legislations passed. I wonder. What type of messaging or how should we tell our community members um, to complain 
um, if they, if they're, you know, if they license plates are constantly being taken pictures of, or they're constantly being caught on cameras, that's not a person there to complain against. So I'm just curious on what we could be doing as a board to make sure those community members feel supported and also have a voice heard when they feel like they're being wrong by individuals. I don't even know how to explain it, but I just have to explain that here. It, it, it kind of pops in my mind as we were talking. Yeah, I think one of the things is, and, I, and I've said this from the beginning, and I continue to say it, is that until we educate the community on license plate readers, what they do, how they're stored, um, where they're going to be located, you know, I think that people are just unaware of, you know, much about, you know, the impact that license plate readers will have on their daily lives. I don't think that that's something that has been shared with the community members in a way that I think that they have a clear understanding. I've had, I've sat in on several meetings and been invited to a district meeting regarding license plate readers. And it was obvious by the questions and the, and the curiosity of the community members that they just didn't have a clear grasp on what was happening, how they would be deployed, what they would do if they, exactly, if they had a complaint about a license plate reader, how long their information would be stored, um, it was just a host of questions that it, no one seemed to have the answers to. And so, yeah, for us, we haven't really thought about that. It's a good question. It's something that we'll have to figure out, sit down as a group um, and figure out what do we do about those types of complaints regarding surveillance and technology. Um, yeah, I don't have a good answer for you on that right now, um, but it's something that we can look into. Thank you, Director Holloway. Um, I like. Go ahead, Mr. Holloway. Um, that that would be a good tool if it's used properly. Um, people that I've talked with seem to be concerned that it probably be used in certain zip code areas as opposed to others. If it would, if we use fairly throughout Davidson County, they can deal with that. But we know for a fact that won't happen. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. That is a, a concern that people have voiced, uh, definitely. Any, Dr. Hildreth, I saw your hand up earlier. Not sure if you still had a question. No, thank you. In the interest of time, I put it down, but I wanna um, thank you, uh, Chair, for the work that you've done and the letters that you've given on our behalf. I wanna thank Director Fitcher for her report and I always had my hand up specifically to welcome our member and also point with specificity to the language in the amendments that created us. That is short. So I like to do that because I think it's always important to remember when we're asked what is, what is the basis, what is the goal and orientation to go back to the original language of the people. In that actual language concerning training, the statement is board members are to receive related orientation and training, including the completion of Metro Nashville Citizen Police Academy or an equivalent training and ongoing civil rights and equity training from entities concerned with police oversight. And through the authorization of this board, we expanded that language and scope in section 14 of the memorandum of understanding, which I am pleased to note is now posted on the website. I'm looking at it now. I'm going to post a link to that in my social media. And I would urge all of our community who are following along here and those who are engaged with community as you pass the word and the education of the type that member Campbell Gooch has mentioned to be sure to go to those source documents that are on the COB website now. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hildreth. I have one other thing to add. Thank you, Dr. Hildreth. Um, when when Member Gooch mentioned like the, the, the complaints, I did want to say just so that everyone is clear, 
um, whenever we have a um, use of force that involves a police officer involved shooting, it will always be an investigation into that. There's, you know, so that you will always know that we will open up an investigation into that. And so, and then the second thing I wanted to say in regards to director initiated investigations, because we had one maybe even two, they weren't um, necessary. Um, they weren't police officers using excessive force um, in that regard with the shooting, but we did get a lot of complaints from um, community members regarding two juveniles being detained um, and arrested. And so that um, I have based on our bylaws and our rules, the authority to open up investigations um, if there's some type of egregious behavior from a police officer and in that particular case, I was um, I saw video footage of an, inc an incident um, that I felt was enough to warrant an investigation. Thank you, Director Fitchard. Uh, Ms. McCree. Um, Dr. Fitchard, thank you for opening that investigation. Um, a lot of community community members were concerned about that specific incident and I got a lot of questions about it. So just for public um, notice and public record, can you give a little bit of a breakdown of what you found in your investigation of that case? So that case is still under investigation. Um, and when it's an active investigation, we don't really discuss the ins and outs, but I will tell you that of course we haven't had a juvenile case. Um, this will be the first um, and because it's on video, of course, you know, there could be others, but, you know, we haven't had any complaints about those. But this this one specifically, um, we are working on it. Of course, there are really laws that protect juveniles and their identity, as well as, um, you know, there's a host of things that involve children that, um, so right now we're still trying to work through that and figure out how we're able to go about completing a thorough investigation um, regarding juveniles and children. Um, and hopefully at some point we'll be able to connect with the juvenile courts, figure out a, a good complaint process, a process through the juvenile, you know, court system or the agency, um, Juvenile Justice Center, um, on how we're able to um, facilitate a complaint um, that involves juveniles and be able to get the information that we need. Um, and still, um, of course, it, uh, some of that stuff we'll, we'll never be able to have access to based on the Tennessee code. So that's Thank all you. I can tell you now. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, and so as a follow-up question to that, I know there's a lot of information that we may not be able to get access to because of the juvenile laws here in Tennessee. Um, and so that leads me into school resource officers. Um, there's a lot of information that we just don't have around the program. Um, is there information through an administrative investigation that would be possible for um, the COB to conduct? Like, could we get information through an administrative investigation? Or I don't know if it's possible to get certain information um, on that program due to it being in our school, school system. Well, I think that that's two different things. I think that if you want information on school resource officers or you want to do some research into that, that would be something that you would send through our research, um, you know, our research team um, and maybe sit down and think about ways that we could um, have some research into that. That's completely different than an administrative investigation. Um, I think that what you're looking for is more um, information, and I think that that would be conducted through um, a research uh, policy, possibly advisory report, or some type of research into um, school resource and and um, school resource officers and NMPD school resource officers. Um, and how they operate with Metro Public Schools, possibly. I don't really know, but those are two different things. And um, I'm sure our um, lead analyst, um, <laughs> Dr. Valier, would be able to help you kind of figure out what direction um, you would be interested in, um, in exploring um, as it pertains to school resource officers. Perfect, thank you so much. You're welcome. And I want to say one thing before I wrap up, and that is we have some proposed resolution reports that are um, that I'm working on. So I think in this next meeting that we have next month, 
you know, I'm trying to determine whether or not we're going to have to have a special call meeting um, because we have, I think, three that are ready to go. And I think that the investigation team has just finished up a couple more. Um, and so with us maybe having to go back to in person, I'm sure we're, we're not going to be the only agency doing that. Um, remember that we have to have all of our meetings at a metro government facility. I, I'm just trying to figure out, and we will figure out how we're able to present those proposed resolution reports in our meeting um, and still be, um, you know, cognizant of the time that we have. So I will get back with you all to keep you posted on that. But we do have proposed resolutions, reports that need to be presented to the board. And I'm hoping that we can get those done next month. The second thing is I sent over the proposed resolution report from the last board meeting to Chief Drake. Um, and so we will, uh, we're awaiting his reply. So um, that was just sent to, it was kind of delayed because I was out of the office. And so hopefully we will have a response within the um, the allotted and agreed upon timeframe. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I'm really excited about the work ahead. I'm, I'm, um, I'm curious, and this might not be an option, so this might be a question for legal. Is there a way we can do a mix of both online and in person, or do we have, are we transitioning to only in person? And the reason why is because these online meetings may be something that we can pull together fairly quickly um, if there's a need be, but I just want to see if, if, if that's an option. Mr. Dickerson. Uh, yes, thank you, Alex Dickerson, Metro Legal. Unfortunately, the governor's executive order is the only source of authority that permits any electronic. So the hybrid meeting option is only in, enabled through today. So we'll have to, to do everything remaining in person. Thank you, Mr. Dickerson. Any other questions for Director Pitchard? If not, I'll take it to approve the minutes. Hildreth, so moved. Thank you, Dr. Hildreth. Is there a second? This is Member Witzel. I second. Thank you, Mr. Witzel. To a roll call vote here, Mr. Brown is with us. Mr. Campbell Gooch? Yes. Uh, Brown, Mr. Yes. Brown is here. Got it. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Um, Mr. Goddard? Aye. Mr. Hayes? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Dr. Hildreth? Aye. Mr. Holloway? Aye. Dr. Kong? Aye. Ms. McCree? Aye. Mr. Witzel? Aye. And Mr. Wynn? Aye. Thank you, everyone. And, and now we'll hand it over to Liz. Great, thanks. I'm just getting set up one second here. Great. Can someone tell me if that's in full screen for y'all? It looks good, Liz. It is for me. Great, thank you. So today I'm going to be presenting on the current draft of the policy advisory report on MPD hiring procedures. All the board members should have received this current draft as well as a red line version comparing it to the older draft and a change document where we highlighted all the changes that we made based on feedback in our one-on-one -on -one sessions um, with everybody here. So I'm going to start off with I'm going to start off with the research questions and scope. So the COB was asked to do this report by the NAACP to conduct a review of Metro Nashville's Police Department's applicant background investigations. The two main questions that we were looking at were, what are the criteria for background checks and how are they conducted in the recruitment process, specifically looking at past incidents of violence or use of force, 
and what disqualifiers were for employment eligibility. The second question was, what are the processes for investigating potential biases of recruits prior to their employment by MMPD? So to create this report, we reviewed policies and procedures related to the hiring process for sworn officers. Again, we focused on the background investigation process and the criteria used to disqualify applicants. The recruitment sections, standard operating procedures or SOPs, the civil service rules and procedures, the MMPD manual, as well as existing research and literature on police recruitment and applicant background investigations. We also conducted interviews with Deputy Chief K. Loki, the HR Director Sue Bibb, and Lieutenant Ryan Hampton of the recruitment section. We use quantitative aggregate data that was provided to Mayor Cooper's Policing Policy Commission that show annual figures for stages of the hiring process from 2015 through September of 2020. And we compiled data sets for each hiring phase so that we were able to analyze the data and graph it. So we found that there were eight main steps to MMPD's hiring process. We delve into these in great detail in the report, but I'm going to do just a quick overview right now for the public. Um, so the hiring process begins when an applicant applies to the position of police officer online through the main Metro government um, human resources page. Applicants information are sent to MMPD and MMPD sends applicants their personal history statement packet. This is a 35 page packet that includes a variety of releases and questions about um, their history, educational, employment, uh, legal, and sort of any behavioral things that might impact their ability to become a police officer. This packet must be notarized and it's due at the civil service testing date. So an applicant must get that notarized, bring it with them. At the civil service testing date, they'll complete both the written civil service exam as well as the physical agility test in the same day. Applicants that pass the civil service testing will move on to the background investigation and applicant interview phase. Their files assigned to a background investigator who will use their personal history statement to conduct background investigation. They'll also send out uh, personal reference questionnaires to former employers, places of residence, uh, significant others and spouses, um, as well as listed references. And they will also in this phase conduct an interview with a three person panel. And within this phase, social media accounts are also reviewed. Once an investigator finishes their investigation, they'll prepare a summary and that'll go to the deputy chiefs of police panel. This panel is comprised of all of the deputy chiefs as well as the director of the Office of Professional Accountability, OPA. This panel then has a vote on whether an applicant is qualified, disqualified, deferred. Um, and in order for an applicant to move forward, they must be voted as qualified by at least four of the six members of this panel. If an applicant is qualified and moves forward in the process, they'll be given a conditional offer of employment. And this conditional offer must be signed before they move on to what is phase seven here, psychological testing, which is conducted by a third party called Hughes and McDaniel, a drug screening, a medical exam conducted by the civil service medical examiner, and a CVSA exam, which is a computer voice stress analyzer exam conducted by a trained professional instead of um, a polygraph, which the department doesn't use. And the results of these screenings and tests are presented by the behavioral health manager, medical examiner, CVSA examiner, and the HR director to a final panel, which includes the members of the deputy chiefs of police panel again. Uh, this panel can, you know, bring up any other questions or concerns they may have about an applicant or decide to move forward with an applicant, in which case they will be accepted into an upcoming uh, MMPD training academy class. Here, I wanted to highlight some of the findings that we found and used to make our recommendations. The first being that the background investigators that work for the recruitment section are part-time retired police officers of the 14 investigators. There are four women and 10 men, and one of the men is African-American. 
Based on recruitment data analysis, we found that there are racial and gender disparities at each stage of the hiring and recruitment process. MMPD looks for potential biases from applicants in a variety of ways, including the personal history statement, personal reference questionnaires, a review of social media accounts, interviews, psychological testing, as well as the CBSA exam. And finally, post standards prohibit certification for any individual that has entered a guilty plea or a plea of nolo contendere related to force, violence, theft, dishonesty, gambling, liquor, or other alcoholic beverages or controlled substances, including a DUI. If an applicant does meet post qualifications, the DCP, DCOP panel at MMPD still has discretion when it comes to some of the other potential disqualifiers. So the first four recommendations are related to the personal history statement. The first being the personal history statement should include law enforcement specific questions for applicants that have been who have been law enforcement officials in another jurisdiction. This should include questions about unnecessary use of force, bias based policing and any disciplinary actions. Recommendation number two, question 99 of the personal history statement asking whether applicants have a prejudice that will impact their job performance should be changed to a series of questions focused on discriminatory attitudes and behaviors. Recommendation number three, MMPD should evaluate reasons for civil service testing no-shows through surveys and interviews with individuals who did not show up to testing. When impediments are identified, changes to the process should be considered, and if made, an evaluation plan should be in place to assess whether the change was effective. MMPD should aim to have at least 50% of invited applicants take the civil service tests. Number four, MMPD should publicly release their planned evaluation report, focusing on whether changing the physical agility section of the civil service test reduces gender and racial disparities in attending and passing the test. These next few recommendations focus on the background investigation process and interviews. Number five, MMPD should work to increase the diversity of the recruitment section's background investigators. Number six, MMPD should review at least annually the demographics of applicants that have been assigned to the background investigators and the number of qualifications resulting from each investigator to identify potential biases. One investigator having higher disqualification rates for a specific demographic group than other investigators does not necessarily indicate bias, but it suggests that an in-depth audit is needed. Number seven, the recruitment section's SOPs should address the timing of the social media review in the hiring process and the procedures used by MMPD personnel for reviewing social media content. This should include a standard solicitation process regarding applicant social media information, Applicants who refuse to supply access to social media accounts should be disqualified from the hiring process. These next recommendations are about the Deputy Chiefs of Police Panel. Number eight, SOP should require that if an applicant is the subject of a criminal investigation after review by the DCOP panel, regardless of the investigation's outcome, the DCOP panel must review the incident in the context of the applicant's full background investigation and re-vote on the applicant's qualification status. Number nine, MMPD should add the executive director of the COB or their designee as a voting member to the DCOP panel. Number 10, the recruitment section's SOPs should address conflicts of interest of the deputy chiefs of police panel and direct panelists to recuse themselves from deliberating or voting on an applicant's qualification when they have a personal or business relationship with the applicant. And our final recommendation is a general one. Recommendation 11, MMPD should evaluate the pre-academy employment program to determine whether it improves training academy outcomes and early employment outcomes compared to those who did not participate in the program and release a public report on the program. Before we go into questions, uh, we wanted to highlight what potential next steps look like for the policy advisory report process. Uh, so today, after this presentation, um, the board will have the option to vote to release the policy advisory report for public comment. This means that this draft of the report would be posted online and sent to our community groups and stakeholders. 
and we would be open for a period of public comment where we'll accept both written and verbal feedback on the report. We are also scheduled to have a public comment meeting with Live Colin, and that would be two weeks from today, where um, on Wednesday, May 12th, where we would speak about the report and allow people to call in to comment. And then there would have to be a specially called meeting of the board where this policy advisory report is the only agenda item um, in order for the vote, in order for the board to vote to pass it. Um, with changes or as is um, and officially adopt the recommendations and issue the report as a COB report. And tentatively, that would be the first week of June. So now I will open up the floor to any questions and um, myself and Dr. Willey are here if we have any questions or concerns. Thank you, Liz. I wanted to ask the um meeting where people can call in is that a board-led meeting or a staff-led meeting is that since we can't hold virtual meetings anymore can we still allow people to call in that's a good question um we just were able to schedule that meeting this morning i hadn't myself thought about whether that would be i mean it sounds like it can't be virtual so it would have to be in person um but I believe we're allowed to do call in comments. I would have to ask legal. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Dickerson. Yeah, so that ends up being um, almost more of a ITS staffing issue than a legal issue. Um, the, the problem is that ITS, as you might imagine, has been spread pretty thin during COVID with staffing all these virtual WebEx meetings. And I think the plan was once everything went back in person that they would not uh, have the ability to do that. So it's really just a discussion you need to have with ITS to see if there's a capability. I don't know of a legal problem that would exist from allowing um, the in-person comments as well as uh, phone call-ins. That's just the same. Like we allow for, like for, for instance, planning or you know BZA will allow written email communications and voicemails to be part of the record. So I don't see a problem with allowing call-ins also, so long as you're doing public in-person allowance as well. Thank you, Mr. Dickerson. Uh, Mr. Camel Gooch. Yes. Yeah. Thank y'all for this. Um, the reports are like my favorite part, and y'all do such a great job at like displaying the information, walking through the recommendations, and just like breaking it down in a very plain English. I always feel like I learned so much from these. I, so I want to say thank you first. Um, also, before I ask my question, can either of the research team, can you all talk about the context for which this uh, report is done? I know we kind of glanced over it, um, and I know it's in a report, but can you kind of like speak to why the NAACP requested this report? Sure. So um, the NAACP reached out and requested this report um, after an incident in which um, a, I'm sorry, my video just went out there. Okay, um, sorry about that. My internet is being a little slow. Uh, so we were requested to do this report after an incident where um, there was a shooting where um, an MPD officer was involved in this shooting before he became a police officer. Um, and at the time of the shooting, he was found, he was not prosecuted. It was found to be self-defense and so um, the MPD went ahead with hiring him and he started at the MPD training academy. Um, and more recently in the fall of 2020, that case, um, was being reviewed again and there were charges brought, um, in that shooting case. And so we were looking at, um, the hiring procedures, the background investigation process, um, and how an incident like that might be looked at in the future. Um, when charges are brought or not in a case where um, a recruit or applicant is involved. Uh, thank you for that. So just like in your opinion, would um, where did the where did the 
system as it sits now, where did it where did it uh, fail? As far as so we didn't look into that specific incident. We definitely examined things in general as they are now. There are a lot of changes going on at the recruitment section or changes in leadership and different um, things that they're developing and working on. So I can't speak to that specific incident and what may have failed there. Um, but one of our recommendations about the DCOP panel um, was should an incident like that arise again where um, someone is involved that is an applicant going through the hiring process that that would have to be reviewed again in the full context of that person's background. Well, thank you for that. And then my last question is around the, I thought the, the piece around the um, background in investigators diversity and like how to spot bias um, from the background investigator, I think that was a piece that was like extremely insightful. I hadn't, even, I hadn't thought or considered that that would be a thing. So I was just curious if you could just talk more on recommendation six. And I think recommendation six, I didn't write it down verbatim and I don't have it in front of me, but I believe it's the one where you talk about um, that like tracking who the background investigators are investigating and then correlating that with what biases or just trying to track the biases that they could possibly have. If you could just speak on speak on that one real fast. Sure. So there is a process in place where um, background investigation files are reviewed before they are sent up the chain of command. Um, but we felt like there would be a benefit to having a more formal review process that's more like an audit to look at the different people that have been assigned to these investigators. Um, especially, you know, looking back over time, since there are so many people that investigators are reviewing each year, um, that there would be sufficient data to do a great review of um, the different investigators, who's been assigned to them, who's been disqualified or disqualified, um, and really use that data to see if there's any biases that, that might come up there. Thank you for it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Uh, Mr. Wynn. Uh, thank you, Chair. Liz, that, the great report, by the way. I, I read your analysis on the, the background and, and hiring. It's it really it kind of brought back memories of, of a system that wasn't as thorough when I was hired. But I want to ask you a question. And this may be really minutia that you didn't look at. I didn't see anywhere where the background folks are checking the national post decertification database. You know, Idolist is the organization for all the post commissions around the country. They maintain a database where if they if they decertify an officer for violent crime, they can't go portable and come to Nashville from anywhere else. Uh, I didn't see where they were working with them, and they might. And the other problem is. Agencies around the country will often let an officer leave before they're arrested for a violent crime. Then they'll keep their certification and they'll come to another agency. And a phone call from that agency, all they get is he quit. And the, and they worry about that, that agency worries about being sued for divulging any kind of past disciplinary uh, history. How do they deal with that? Is that something that, that, that you found out in your research? So I won't say that we heard about that specific database mentioned um, in our interviews with MMPD. I will say that um, there were, it was expressed to us that it is really challenging to obtain personnel information for people that have been law enforcement in other jurisdictions. Um, and like you said, often a phone call will get very superficial information about, you know, this person left in good standing or not, or um, just sort of the very basic information. and. Um, the HR director at MMPD expressed that it's always best to go review those files in person if possible. Um, and that does take more resources and, you know, a budget for MMPD personnel to be able to travel to other states across the country to look at those files themselves. Um, so I think that is, you know, a, an issue that they're aware of, obviously. Um, but I will say that that specific database wasn't mentioned to us as part of the process. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. 
And uh, this is Peter Valier. Uh, we can follow up and, and inquire specifically about that. Um, and I also want to point out that the first recommendation is trying to get is trying to get to some of those challenges with reviewing uh, personnel files. So if um, if applicants are specifically asked if you've been a law enforcement officer in the past, do you have what disciplinary actions have have you had? That would put some of the onus on um, the applicant to report that. If it, if it, if they were not able to get uh, some of the information through, um, from the agency. So hopefully by asking on the personal history statement would um, allow for honest responses um, up front and that could then be uh, compared against the officer's file um, from the previous agency. Thank you. This is Officer Holloway. Um, as I've said before in September and October, the system is broken. Now that we can see some ways that we can fix that. But I have a question from the captain, if I may, if he's still on. The, the captain that's the liaison. Mr. Larry. Okay. I, the class, we had a class in the academy, probably graduated either in March or um, in April, or, or getting ready to graduate. Have they graduated yet? Uh, um, um, what do we have? Have they already graduated? Yes, sir. We had a, a class, just Carlos Lara. We had a class that graduated, I believe, in March. Uh, we have a new class in the academy right now, and they've already gone through uh, quite a bit of their training, probably at least a month in, um, possibly a month and a half. So we've got a group that just came out and a one that came in right afterwards. So we have okay. a new class. Okay, the class is just graduated. How many of them do we have? How many blacks do we have in that class? I don't have that exact number. I can find out. Um, I know there was around, I believe it was 50-ish that, uh, that graduated, but I don't have the exact demographic numbers, but I can get that for you if you need it. Please do. Um, I know you remember telling us that you had about 50 in the class, but nobody made them miss how many black. My main thing, and like I said once before, we need the police department to reflect the community. And if we're going to graduate a class with one or two blacks, you know, then we'll never make the um, department reflect the community. Absolutely, sir. What I'll do is I will get that information. I will send it to Director Fitchard, and she can forward it to whoever uh, would like it. That's okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. Thank you, Captain Lara. Uh, Mr. Hayes. I just wanted to commend the group on the report and just uh, thank them for uh, soliciting input, one-on-one uh, one -on -one input from the board members uh, for the report. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank yeah, you, we Harris. really appreciated everyone's feedback in those one-on-one -on -one sessions. So thank you to everyone that participated in that feedback. Thank you. Mr. Wynn, I still see your hand up. I'm not sure if um, you had another question. No, no, sorry, I don't. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, uh, if there are any more questions for the research team? And the next step here is to uh, approve it to move forward for public comment. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. There would be a vote um, to approve it for public comment. If there were any changes that someone wanted to make, those could be voiced now, and it could also be a vote to approve with changes. Okay, so if somebody wants to move to approve the report as is or with changes um, to go forward to the public comment step, take the motion. I move. Thank you, Mr. Campbell-Gooch. Michaela McCree, I second. Thank you, Ms. McCree. Any uh, focused discussion there? Not to a vote call vote. Mr. Brown. Was that an aye, Mr. Brown? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Aye. Mr. Goddard. Aye. Mr. Hayes. Aye. Dr. Hildreth. Aye. Mr. Holloway. 
Aye. Dr. Kong? Aye. Ms. McCree? Aye. Mr. Witzel? Aye. And Mr. Wynn? Aye. I vote as well. So will we, um, will you all work on scheduling those meetings then? Yes, we will work on scheduling um, the in-person session. We have a room reserved for Wednesday, uh, May 12th at 4.30 p.m. at the Howard Office Building. Um, so we are planning on having that in person and we would always love as much um, as many board members as possible to be there. We're also planning on streaming that live on MNN um, and having it recorded on YouTube. But we will um, have manage those details and have it scheduled. Thank you, Dr. Valier. And thank you, Liz, for that too. We're gonna miss you. Um, any public comment? We received any questions or recorded messages? No, we haven't received any recorded messages. Okay, then uh, any new business or announcements? Yeah, I wanted to say one thing. Um, I wanted to encourage our new members. I'm, I'm sure our old members are aware of NACL is the agency um, that helped um, create um, and give us information on the creation of civilian oversight. So the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement, NACL, we've adopted a lot of their um, policies, procedures in regards to civilian oversight, especially their ethics. Um, I want to tell you that you can go to their website. They, they have multiple trainings available. Um, they have one coming up on May the 18th, um, 2021 at 1 p.m. It's the National Initiative for Building Community Trust and Justice. Um, the National Network for Safe Communities um, is going to spearhead this. Um, it is a collaborative public safety partnership through um, with the U.S. Department of Justice. And it says the National Initiative for Building Community Trust and Justice um, will have guest speakers Paul Smith and Danielle Davis um, from the National Network. Um, and they will be covering some topics. Um, Ms. Davis um, specifically focuses on strategies to reduce gender-based violence and strengthen police community trust, um, especially with survivors of intimate partner and sexual violence. Um, and then there's Mr. Paul Smith. He will be the guest speaker. He's the director of reconciliation at the National Network for Safe Communities. So that is available. And if you want to join in, um, just let us know and we will get you registered. Thank you, Director Fitcher. Mr. Hayes. And I don't know, I guess this could be new slash old business, but uh, in the minutes, uh, I guess that's under this uh, MMPD response to policy advisory report concerning the use of force. I was just trying to find out the status or uh, because I, I guess it was supposed to be a reply. So I was just trying to find out the status. Yes, we did send that to uh, Chief Drake. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Any other new business or announcements? If not, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Your second. I second. Thank you, Dr. Kong. I'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Brown? Mr. Brown, yes. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Mr. Campbell Gooch? Aye. Mr. Goddard? Aye. Mr. Hayes? Aye. Dr. Hildreth? Aye. Mr. Holloway? Aye. Dr. Kong? Aye. Ms. McCree? Aye. Mr. Witzel? Aye. And Mr. Wynn? Aye. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll see you in person next month. This has been a service of the Metro National Network.
If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.